Many people have spoken of the correlation between music and mathematics, both aptitudes and interests. And once the famous 19th century mathematician Felix Klein, a great mathematician who was also totally unmusical, was at a party which people were discussing the very thing, the correlation between music and mathematics, both aptitudes and interests. And Klein looked more and more puzzled. He said, but gentlemen, I don't understand. Mathematics is beautiful. And speaking of mathematics, I'm a firm believer in relating mathematics to common sense. Now, I've taught all sorts of courses from graduates down to remedial. And uh, in one of my remedial courses, on the final examination, I gave a typical algebra problem, typical finding the ages of a father, mother, and child. And I said to the class, on this problem, I'll give you one hint. All eyes turn to me eagerly. I said, if the child turns out to be older than either parent, then you've done something wrong. You know, I've learned so much teaching remedial students. The things we take for granted, which uh, we think everybody knows and doesn't. For example, in one of my remedial classes, the students were quite surprised to learn that when you divide a quantity into two equal parts, that each part is one half of the whole. They never realized that before. Another very interesting thing. I once gave a remedial class the following problem. I said, suppose if you have a piece of string, a hundred inches long, you will cut off seven inches. How much is left? They couldn't get it. I mean, uh, when I told them that the answer <laughs> was 93, one of the kids said, oh, you get it by subtraction. See, if I had asked them how much, how much is 100 minus 7, they would have gotten the answer. But they had no idea how subtraction applied to the real world. I just had the following funny story. It's true. A high school student I know <clears throat> told me that when he was in high school, he was doing very badly in mathematics. So they sent him to their principal's office. And their principal said to him in a thunderous voice, why are you doing badly in mathematics? Said, oh, but sir, I don't like mathematics. Oh, but you've got to like mathematics. Suppose if you leave here, you don't know your mathematics. You go into a grocery store, your bill is 87 cents. You give the grocer a dollar, and he gives you only 13 cents change, you wouldn't even know the difference. This is a true story. I want to tell you something now, quite lovely. After I published my first book, what was the name of this book? Of Puzzles. A few weeks later, I received a letter from an unknown female who suggested an alternative solution to one of my problems, which I thought was far more elegant than the one I gave. Mine was correct, but hers was elegant, more elegant. And she signed her letter, Love, and her name. Well, I wrote her back. I had no idea whether she was single or married, so I very respectfully wrote, Dear N.S. Dot So-and-So, I told her how much I appreciated her solution. I asked her, do I have permission to use your solution in a subsequent edition of my book? And I said to her, you know, you definitely have mathematical talent. You really should be majoring in mathematics. You should be studying that subject. Well, a couple of weeks later, I received the following letter from her. Dear Professor Smunyan, thank you for your gracious letter. You have my solution, not, you have my permission to use the solution. I am nine and a half years old and in fifth grade. <laughs> that explained the word love. A somewhat related incident. When I was a graduate student at Princeton, one of my uh, classmates was the now eminent mathematician Barry Mazer. We were together graduate students. 19 years after we graduated, I received a letter 
from his then 10-year-old boy, Zeki, who proposed a logic puzzle to me, which was marvelous, and gave me an idea for a whole chapter of logic puzzles. So I called them up. I wanted to congratulate the kid over the telephone, and Barry answered the phone. I told him about this, and Barry said to me over the phone in very soft, conspiratorial tones, look, before I put Zeki on the phone, I want you to know this. He's reading your book, and he loves it. But don't let him know it's math, because he hates math. Interesting. Again, speaking of mathematics, of course, many of you know that if a person is unable to multiply, but if he can add, he can multiply if he has a log table. With a table of logarithms, a person who can add can multiply. Was well, the following nice story told. When Noah's ark landed, the snake said to Noah, if you want me to have children, you'll have to cut that tree up there into pieces. Noah was very puzzled, but he cut the tree into pieces. Noah came back a couple of months later, and sure enough, there were a lot of little snakes. And Noah said to the snake, why did I have to cut the tree up into pieces and what if you'd have children? The snake said, because I'm an adder and I need logs in order to multiply. <laughs> Mathematics, of course, is very close to logic. And uh, some definitions of logic I'm rather fond of. Remember uh, the characterization by Tweedledee and through the looking glass, which is the following. He says, if it was so, it might be. And if it were so, it would be. But since it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. I also like Thurber's characterization of logic <clears throat> and the 13 clocks, which is, since it's possible to touch a clock without stopping it, it follows it's possible to start a clock without touching it. That's logic as I see and understand it. You know, the philosopher Unamuno, the writer Unamuno, is constantly giving a diatribe against rationality, and uh, which, <laughs> which made me once think of the following two-line verse. Unamuno gives reasons why reasons are bad, and the reasons he gives are incredibly bad. Perhaps my favorite definition of logic is that due to Ambrose Bierce in the Devil's Dictionary. It's a wonderful book, by the way. It has some really marvelous items, all sorts of interesting definitions. For example, the definition of an egotist. One who thinks more of himself than he does of me. Now, his definition of logic is lovely. Logic, the art of thinking and reasoning in strict accordance with the limitations and incapacities of the human misunderstanding. The basis of logic is the syllogism thus. Major premise, 60 men can do a piece of work 60 times as fast as one man. Minor premise, one man can dig a post hole in 60 seconds. Therefore, conclusion, 60 men can dig a post hole in one second. Here's a, here's a syllogism I'm rather fond of, which goes as follows. Some cars rattle. My car is some car. So no wonder my car rattles. Speaking of syllogisms, someone once asked Bertrand Russell, what is really new in the conclusion of a syllogism? Logically, everything on the conclusion is already in the premises. Upon which Russell wisely answered, well, true, there may not be anything logically new in the conclusion, but the conclusion can certainly have psychological novelty, as the following story will reveal. He told the following story. Once at a party, someone told a risque story, and someone else said, oh, oh, be careful. Remember, the abbot is here. But which the abbot said, oh, 
We men of the cloth are not as naive as you think. Why, the things I've seen in my lifetime. My very first penitent was a murderer. A few minutes later, a certain lord walked in, Lord so-and-so, and they were going to introduce him to the abbot. said, do you know the abbot so-and-so? He said, oh, do I know him? I know him very well. I was his first penitent. The following story nicely illustrates the uh, fact, the logical fact, that if A implies B, it does not logically follow that not A implies not B. The story is, joke is, about a college freshman who didn't know what he should study. So he once asked his great advisor, what should I study? The great advisor said, study logic. He said, what is that? So, well, logic enables one to uh, infer one proposition from another. Can you give me an example? Yes. Tell me, do you have a lawnmower? I said, yes, I do. From which I infer that you have a lawn. Yes, I do have a lawn. From which you probably have a house. Yes, indeed, I have a house. And which uh, I, you're probably married. Yes, I am married. And you have children. Yes, I do have two children, from which I can infer that you are a heterosexual male. So, oh, I have indeed a heterosexual male. Gee, this logic is amazing. From the fact that I had a lawnmower, you could deduce that I was a heterosexual male. It's remarkable. Well, a few minutes later, the student meets a friend of his, another college freshman, he meets him in the hall. And says, well, you know, you should study logic. He said, what is that? Well, logic enables one to deduce one proposition from another. For example, do you have a lawnmower? The friend said, no. The student said, you faggot! Let me now ask you a question, a riddle. What is it that's greater than God, the dead eat it, and if the living eat it, they die. It's greater than God, the dead eat it, and if the living eat it, they die. Well, what do the dead eat? Obviously nothing. So nothing is the answer. Nothing is greater than God, the dead eat nothing, and if the living eat nothing, they die. This joke, like many others, is based on the, uh, from the, the idea of regarding the word nothing as the name of an entity, which of course it isn't. Uh, many examples of that abound. For example, the old grammar school proof that a, uh, a syllogism proving that a cat has ten lives. It goes this way. No cat has nine lives. One cat has one more life than no cat. Therefore, one cat has ten lives. Again, this principle was used by uh, Lewis Carroll and through the looking glass, which at one point the king asked this messenger, whom did you pass on the road? The messenger said, nobody. He said, which proves that nobody walks slower than you. Another application of this principle is of the following syllogism. First, a question, which is better, eternal happiness or a ham sandwich. <laughs> Most people, of course, would say eternal happiness. But the following syllogism proves that's not the case. Here's the syllogism. Nothing is greater than eternal happiness. A ham sandwich is better than nothing. Therefore, a ham sandwich is better than eternal happiness. Actually, uh, the notion of nothing is closely related to something which is very important in mathematics, name of the notion of the empty set. The set which contains no elements at all. This is somewhat puzzling to some beginners. My favorite characterization of the empty set is the set of all people in a theater after everyone has left. This really gives a feeling of emptiness, doesn't it? You know, once I said to my, I told my wife Blanche about the empty set, and she was puzzled. She said. Do mathematicians really use this notion? I said, oh yes. So where do they use it? I said, it's used all over the place. She thought for a while, I said, oh yes, I guess it's like the rest of the music. Not bad.